Let's stand together. Another wonderful day the Lord had given us. Beautiful, beautiful day. And as we come together as a family tonight, we want to dedicate it first, of, first and foremost to our, our Father. So let's do that. Lord, we come before you again tonight, Lord, with reverence, thanksgiving, and praise. As we enter your gates, we do it with rejoicing and recognizing, Lord, that, that we are alive in you eternally. And so all we can do, Father, is just praise you, thank you. And that's what we want to do tonight, Lord. We, we uh, set this time aside for that as a corporate body here to bring you glory, to reverence your name, to learn from you, Father. Have your way in us, your people. We pray in your name. Amen.
Thank you to be, for allowing us to be in your presence tonight, Lord. I want to thank you that we serve an amazing God. There's nobody like you, Lord. And there's nobody that loves us the way you do, Lord God. And there's nothing like your love. There's nothing like, Father, that intimacy that you offer every time we gather, Lord. So thank you for meeting us here tonight, Lord God. And Father, I'm amazed concerning the Word of God. Every time I go into it, Lord, I'm amazed, Lord God, at what you say, Lord God. Yes. So, Lord, we pray that we would hear what you would have us to know, Lord God. We pray that our hearts would be soft, Lord, and moldable. And you'd conform us into the image of Jesus in some way, Lord God. Change our character, Lord. And Father, we need you tonight, Lord God. Now touch us, Lord, in a special way. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, and hopefully you all do, turn with me to Second Chronicles, chapter 12. Now, let's give a little bit of background. You need it. Last week we saw the nation of Israel divided into two kingdoms. One of them is the upper ten tribes, which is called the Northern Kingdom, or Israel. The other one is called the Southern Kingdom, which is two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, which is called the Southern Kingdom. So we have a civil war going on in the nation of Israel. And I thought it was pretty relevant for us today concerning what is happening in our nation. I want to read the word to you, the meaning of civil war. 
because I think it's very relevant today. It means war between geographical sections, like the North and the South, there was a civil war. But it has more meaning than that. Political factions of the same nation. So let me ask you this question. Do you see any political factions in our nation today? today? <laughs> During the time of the writing of this book, because of the sins of Solomon and because of the sins of the nation, there was civil war. God divided the nation. And my question that we need to ask ourselves, is there any kind of sin in our nation today? Is there anything that is going on that we can look at that is evident that is causing us to be a nation that is divided the way we are? I don't believe even a war, if we were at war, that would bring us back as a nation. I don't believe it, we can't. There's too much division, there's too much water under the bridge. So what do we do concerning this? Whose side are we on? Let me tell you, first of all, you don't want to be on the Democratic side, the Democrat side. You don't want to be on the Republican side. You want to be on God's side. That's how it works. And you want to stay in the truth no matter what. No matter what it costs you, the truth never changes. It never deviates. It never moves. It is like the rock of Gibraltar, and we need to stay on the truth of what God says. Not what people say is the truth, not half-truths, but the whole truth concerning the Word of God. And when the, God makes a promise that when the storm's over, then what's going to happen is we're going to still be standing. Now, some people have asked me the question, Pastor, what's, what is... How much longer before the rapture happens? Things are getting bad. Are we going to be going through some of these things? The only person that knows when that's going to be in the sense of the rapture and how long we're going to go through certain things is God and God only. And what God wants us to do is he wants us to depend on him, trust him, and draw near to him. I was reading Psalms 91 this morning, and it talks about being under the shadow of of the Almighty, or the angel of God. If you read Psalm 91, it'll comfort you. But you have to put yourself in that place. And in the days we live, having a civil war, so to say, we need to know that God sits on the throne, that he's in control of everything that happens. So there was a civil war happening in Israel. Nation was divided. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is a king of the southern kingdom. Jeroboam is the king of the northern kingdom. And in, when this division happens, Rehoboam wants, his, wants all ten tribes to be ruler over. And he gets upset, so he gets 400,000 men to come against the northern kingdom to take his kingdom back. And God sends to him a prophet named Shehemiah. And he tells him, no, this is from me. And Rehoboam says, okay, and goes back home and begins to fortify the cities. But I know I've taught on this part last week somewhat, but I want to just rehash something that I think is really important. Sometimes it's hard to obey God, isn't it? Think about this. You're a young man, but really he's 41. I guess you could say that's young. And he's become the king. He has experienced all the tribes being there. He has experienced the splendor of Solomon, his dad's reign. He was there the whole time. He was one years old 
when his dad took over the kingdom. So he's experienced riches, fame, everything, you name it, he's seen it. He's met probably the, the great, some of the greatest men in the world. He's met them all. And all of a sudden, the kingdom is divided. And I'm supposed to be the king over all of them. And I want it back. And God sends a messenger, like I said. No, this is from me. I want this to be like it is. That would be hard to obey. I'm trying to explain to you and get you to understand that sometimes obedience to God, when God tells us, and it's the best thing, it's the right thing, that it's hard for us to obey. I've said it myself. That's no problem. I can obey God on that. That's simple. I'm already set in stone on that. But there may be something else that may be really hard for you to obey God. And I found it to be true. First of all, you've got your free choice. Second of all, God gives me the ability. If he tells me he wants me to do something, I need to obey him. He doesn't say, you obey me or try it on your own. I'm not going to give you the strength you need, the ability. I have that free choice, but God's going to give me the strength to be able to do what he's called me to do, whether it's yes or no. So we're coming into times in our lives, all of us, that we're going to face whether we're going to obey God when it seems like it's hard to do. But we still need to do it. And Rehoboam does do that. He fortifies the cities all around the two tribes that God has given him. And now it's been about five years. At this point, he's been doing really well with God. And God is blessing his, him being king. But look at the next verse. Now it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and he had strengthened himself that he forsook the law of the Lord and all of Israel along with him. I, it, to me, this is a mind blower. For five years, he's walking close to God. He's obeying God. He's yielding. He's submitting to God. And because he is, his kingdom is becoming established. And he has things in control. Because they were out of control somewhat when his dad was in control. They were out of control. So everything's now in control. And it says here he strengthened himself. In other words, he enabled himself in his own ability. Now, we need personally to be aware of our own strength. It is true, and I know this to be true with walking with God as long as I have, that it is a safer place to be weak than it is to be strong. I'm going to say that again. It is a safer place for you as a Christian to be weak because God makes a promise that when we are weak, then God is strong in us. Now, I believe that God allows us all to have a stake in the flesh. And that's not a S-T-E-A-K. It's an S-T-A-K-E, a stake. It is something that keeps us in a place where we are weak and we know our weakness and we allow God to be strong in us. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 8 and 9, Paul has been asking God to heal him. And God says to him, Paul, don't ask me again. I can't, <laughs> I kind of think here, Paul has that close relationship with God. And he's asked him three times and God says, finally says, shut up, Paul. 
Quit belly aching, Paul. But God explains to him and says why he's going to keep this stake. He says, you know what? I've shown you so much revelation of me. You've had that close relationship with me and you're revealing it out to people. And I don't want the devil to get a hold of you with this. And I don't want you to get all pride and arrogant. I want to keep you humble and I want to keep you dependent on me. So I'm going to allow this stake to be in your flesh for the rest of your life, Paul. That's kind of mean of God, isn't it? I want to say this again to you. Every single one of you this, this evening have a stake in your flesh that God keeps and will not remove because it keeps you in a place of brokenness. How many know what I'm talking about? I do, without a doubt. No ifs and buts, I have it. And you know what? I, I've been like Paul and I've said, I've got to be mad at God. Come on, God, just heal me of this. I don't want this no more. It's sick. It's not a bad thing. It's not a sin that I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. But this is something that God has put in me and God has put in you. And it might be this, real similar. It might be the same thing even for some of you. So we see this man who's a king who's made himself strong. He's taken control now. And now he decides to forsake the Lord. Or really, the law of the Lord. He's going to forsake the Bible. In other words, it was really good for me for five years. But I really don't need it no more. I know what I'm doing. I feel sorry for this guy. He's not as wise as I thought he was. He's listening to the counsel probably of his own mind. And let me say this. Don't listen to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. I want to read this word to you in the Hebrew. He forsook. To leave, to depart, to leave behind. To apostatize, to abandon. Now I want you to notice that Rehoboam did this when he was strong and he's secure, he thought. He trusted in God as long as he felt he needed him. But he grew independent of God instead of more dependent on God. I can honestly say, and as long as I've been walking with God, that God works in my heart continually to make me more dependent on him and less dependent on me. The closer I draw near to God, the closer you draw near to God, the more dependent you're going to become on God. And let me tell you what your natural man says. I don't want to be dependent on God. I want to be self-sufficient and self-standing. That's not how this relationship works with God. In 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 14, 21 through 24, it tells us, that this forsaking of the law of the Lord went so far as the allowance of perverted persons in the land, specifically describing prostitutes' association with the worship of idols. It is possible that the term perverted persons refers to both men and women cultic prostitutes. However, the term was used in Deuteronomy 23 and 17 and 18 in distinction to feminine cultic prostitutes. So literally, this guy forsakes the word of God that he even allows a cult, cultic prostitution and all the things that happen in God's more or less people and God's land. All the kings of Israel to the right were to write the law of God. And they were to memorize it. And they were to read it continually. Because they got their own copy when they became king. The Bible teaches that I word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you, God. Why is that so important? Because like David said, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I need the word of God every day as food. Now look at me, how many of you ate today so far? There's, good. How many like to eat? 
It's not a sin. It's okay if you like to eat. I like to get up in the morning and my wife makes me this kind of shake stuff and I'm not a breakfast person. I, do, I, I like breakfast, but I don't like to eat breakfast. But at noon, when noon comes around, you better stay away from the front of the refrigerator. Because I really like to eat all the soup, sandwich, all this stuff, and man, it tastes so good. And at the beginning, after I've done eating and stuff, I sit there and I just kind of like, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of zone out. And so I get up and I move around and sometimes I take a nap. <laughs> but when after I've eaten, I get up and do stuff and I have a lot more energy, I have a lot more strength. My, my body has to be fed. And it's the same thing with your spirit. You get worn down. You get tired spiritually. And you might even get lazy. Sometimes my wife and I will just have a, nothing to eat. We don't want a bowl of cereal. That's good enough. We don't want to cook, and I don't want to clean the kitchen. I'll help clean it. So I said, heck with it. Forget it. I don't want to eat. So we just have a bowl of cereal with a banana in it. And that's it. But your spirit needs to be fed. It's under attack all day. You don't even realize it. And it wears down. And how you make your spirit to be strong, and there's no other way, is you need the word of God to feed you. It is food for your soul. I want to remind you that God speaks through us through the word of God. How can I know what to do how can I know what to think? How can I know what's in God's mind if I don't know his word or don't, I put his word aside and say, forget it? I want to remind you, this is what Rehoboam did. This is what the whole nation of Israel did. I'm sorry, the whole tribe, the northern and the southern kingdom, Judah, the nation of Judah, they all did it. But I believe the Bible speaks about this in the book of Amos in the last days, that there'll be a famine for the Word of God. That people are not going to love the Word of God. And what they do love about it, I'm not talking about everybody, a big percentage, are going to love their ears to be tickled. In other words, they're going to want, like the book of Peter says in the last days, that they're going to want to hear what they want to hear, and they're not going to want to hear anything that's going to offend their spirits, are going to make them upset. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about any of that changing of the heart. None of those things. Don't tell me those things. Only what I want to hear. I, I, I just won't come back. So how do I, if I don't go to the Word of God, how do I find out, find out how I'm supposed to love? Yesterday I did some marriage counseling. And it was... I thought, okay, okay. And I brought him back to the Word of God. I brought him back to the Word of God every time, every time back to the Word of God. How do I know how to have a good marriage? I go to the Word of God. How do I know that how God wants me to act or how He wants me to serve or how He wants me to pray or how He wants me to worship? How to be a godly man? How to be a godly woman? How do I know? It's through the Word of God. When somebody asks me, what do you think about this? First thing I say, what does God say? And that's what every one of us, when somebody comes to us and asks us a question, that should be the first statement that comes out of our mouth. What does God say? What does the word of God say? In that conversation when I was doing that marriage counseling, the man said, just forget it, man. I'll just get a divorce. I said, what does God say concerning that, man? God said he hates the worship. Well, I'm sick of this. I said, you have an eye problem. And he shut up. Oh. 
Now we see them walking away from the word of God. But I think there are people looking for an excuse to walk away from God today. Maybe they don't like what they hear from the pulpit. Could be. Not everybody likes the truth. Or they can blame the church or other Christians. But I want to remind you of something. The church is a hospital for the sick who God is healing and fixing. As every one of you in this room today are patients, so to say, and so am I. God's working in me. The church is to be a hospital. But we look at the church or they look at people who are at different stages in their walk with God and different stages in God working, and we say, look, them. And we can all do that. God says, no, don't do that. D.L. Moody was dedicating the first building of what later became Moody Bible Institute. He gave the cornerstone a whack on the trowel, with the trowel. Then he made an invocation in this, to this effect. Lord, you know that what this old world needs more than anything else is thy word. We pray that if the day ever comes when anything contrary to the Bible is taught here, You'll wipe this school from the face of the earth. What a nice prayer, huh? I feel the same way. No different. If we ever stop and deviate from the word of God, we're in trouble. And may God remove us out of this building. This is a true story. of a man who was a foreman on a construction job. And he was noted for his vulgarity and ungodly disposition among the men who worked for him. A Christian man on the job was grieved to hear so much cursing, vile language. One day he got up enough courage to speak to his foreman on the matter. He receives this story from the lips of the man. Please listen. He said this, I once was the pastor of the first and a blank church in this city. Some trouble arose in the congregation of such magnitude that there seemed to be no solution. I was so distraught and provoked that I did not know what to do. One Sunday morning, I walked up in the pulpit and I literally tore my Bible into shreds and threw it piece by piece at the congregation. I thought that was funny, but it really isn't funny, I know. Then I walked out of the pulpit and out of the church, vowing never to enter again. And that is why I'm so wicked today. You know, this is an awesome story about a true man and what he felt and what he did. But what's really neat about it is that he realized what he did and the effects of his choice that he made walking away from the word of God. Now, whose fault is it if I forsake the word of God? It is mine and mine alone. I can't blame anyone but myself. Now, I want you to turn with me two different scriptures and then we'll come back here. Keep your finger in this place. And this one's in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Come on, flip through the pages. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5. I'm sorry, it's, uh, I think it's 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, it is, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. It says this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in your mind or troubled, either by spirit or by the word or by letter, as if it's from us, 
as though the day of Christ had come. But let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do not, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you of these things? Now, in the flip your about two pages over, and you'll go to First Timothy chapter four, and it says this in verses one through five, First Timothy four. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times or the latter days, some will depart from the faith. And then it tells what they will cause them to pull away from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. My point is that the Bible teaches that there is going to be forsaking of the word of God in the last days. There's going to be a forsaking of God himself by many people who once walked with God. Don't be one of them. There are people that are saying today there's going to be a great revival. If you come to the prophecy conference, and I'm praying that you do, you will see that they will teach, I'm sure, that this is going to be, there's going to be a great apostasy, but there's not going to be a great revival. There's going to be a great revival in the times of the great tribulation, yes. 144,000 Jewish men, virgins, 12,000 from each tribe will go forth and proclaim the gospel and bring multitudes to Jesus. There may be little spurts of revival. And maybe tonight, God's reviving your heart, I hope, and mine. Now, if I fall away, I want to remind you, if you fall away, it's your fault. It's your choice. My thought many times is how can anyone who really tastes of God leave him? But I also know that we are capable of anything. So I have to remember that I need to do certain things, that I need to do certain things. Now, it says here in this part of these verses that we read, that all of Israel along with him Notice that the choice did not affect just himself. It affected all of Israel. They say, so goes the king, so goes the nation. I have seen parents who have stopped walking with God, reading the word of God, memorizing scripture, and walk in the world. And guess who follows them? Their children. I'm amazed that people who I knew were solid with God, who stopped doing certain things to protect them from falling away, have fallen away from God, and all their family has also. They are no longer interested in God, but let me tell you what they think. I'm okay. Me and God have this thing. No, you have your thing, but God doesn't have his thing. Because if it was God's thing, you'd be doing things God's way. That's how it works. But they are deceived. They literally are deceived. You can talk to them, and they look at you like you're nuts, and they're the brains of the outfit. And it's sad to see. But we're going to see more of this, God says. So prepare yourself and keep yourself. Now, he goes on in verse 2. And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. 
and 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and people without number who came up with him out of Egypt, the Libyans, which are the Libyans, the Shukims, which are the, from the tribes of Libya, the desert, desert tribes, and the Ethiopians, which are the Cushites. He took the fortified cities of Judah and came to Jerusalem. So I want you to notice why God allowed this to be. It says here that they transgressed against the Lord. The word literally means in the Hebrew to act unfaithfully to God. In other words, they just said, God, it would be like a wife, a husband that became unfaithful to their wives and had a different relationship with people of the same sex. Now, why does God allow things like this to be? First of all, whatever we sow, we reap is a promise from God. That's a spiritual law. But also God allows, God allows things like this to happen. Because the book of Hebrews chapter 12 says that God chastens who he loves. And when we get out there and we get into sin and we transgress and we go into all different kinds of things that we know are wrong, God says, I'm not going to leave you out there. I'll leave you out there for a period, but I'm going to send something that's going to waken you up. I'm going to send something in your life that's going to humble you. I don't know what it is, but God does. And it is always to bring you back to that relationship with God because he loves you. God says in Hebrews 12 that I chasten whom I love. How many have been chastened? And you know what? I'm thankful to God that he chastens me. Because I can be out there sleeping and God wakes me and it's sometimes it's a shock the way he wakes me. You got my attention, God. I'm here. And that's exactly what God is doing. God loves us. And so he corrects us at times. Verse 5 says, Then Shemaiah, the prophet, came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah... who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore I have left you in the hands of Shishak. So God, in his great mercy and his great love, sends Shemaiah. This is the same prophet that discouraged Rehoboam from attacking the ten tribes of Israel that rejected his leadership and formed the northern kingdom of Israel. He had the opportunity to speak to all the leaders of Judah because they were gathered on account of Shishak, the invasion. And God says, I'm allowing this because you have forsaken me. Same word we used before. Therefore, I have left you into the hands of Shishak. So what God is really saying to them is, you have brought this on yourself. You've forsaken the Lord, and the Lord has left you. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Okay, give me your attention again. I know you're listening already. If I say to God, because I have a free choice, he's made me in his image, and he's made you in his image. If I say to God, I don't want you in my life like it was before. And I decide I'm going to leave God. If I say to God, stay here right here, don't follow me, stay right here, God's always going to see us because God's omnipresent. You can't get out of the sight of God. But God will leave you in the sense of his spirit in the same way that he had before with you. It'll be gone. God will leave you if you leave God. It doesn't mean that God will not will stop thinking about you or God will stop allowing things happen to bring you back to him. It doesn't mean that or God will stop loving you. It means that you leave, when you leave, you leave God. God says, okay, I'll leave you to yourself. I'll leave you. Go ahead. Do your thing. And if you've ever walked away from God, do you know what I'm talking about? 
why am I emphasizing that? I'm emphasizing that because I'm, God doesn't want you to leave him. If you leave him, things are going to happen that you're not going to like. Think about it when you walked away from God. In your heart, think about things that happened. That wouldn't have happened. Because you would have made different choices. And so he leaves him in the hands of Shishak, which is literally the Egyptian king. He goes on. Let me say this before we go on. By your choice, you give away the freedom you once had. And you go into bondage. And you'll be a servant of Shishak instead of a servant of the Lord, as we will see. In the next verse, we will see the response of God that comes to God from Rehoboam. So the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, the Lord is righteous. The word humble in this word, word means this, to bow down, to be under, to be brought into subjection. These great leaders of men in all fields have not been arrogant or greedy, but the servants. The real servants are they who are true nobility. They're the greatest of all. The Son of God himself declared that he had come not to serve, but to be a servant. Not to be served, but to be a servant, I'm sorry, but to give his life for the ransom of many. I wondered... A long time why some people don't serve the Lord I think that it's probably and this is my closest thought I can come to and I believe is true is because of pride some people think I don't need to serve God I have better things to do. My time is valuable. That is too low for me to bend. Then there are those who, out of pride, serve the Lord. I'm the greatest, ain't I, God? God, you're so lucky to have me. Look how talented I am. I am so gifted, God. And both of these are wrong. We need, to, he, we need to serve God with a humbleness of soul. Ender Murray, most of you know who he is, a great writer, a great walker with God. He wrote this. Humility is perfect quietness of the heart. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret and I am at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all around me above is trouble. I have found it to be true that there are three things that come out of a person's life when they have been with God. The first is humility. The second one is a joy. And the third is holiness. I've heard some people say, well, I've been with God. And the opposite comes out. It doesn't make sense to me. So we see these men humble themselves they take the blame for their sin. They blame nobody else. It belongs to them. And listen what the next words are said by them. The Lord is right. That's pretty heavy. When God sends somebody to you, or you hear something from the pulpit, and you know it's true, 
How do you respond to it? Do you get mad? Let me give you an example. Let's say right now your heart is drifting away from God. Let's say right now you're forsaking God. Be honest. Maybe your heart has drifted away from God. Maybe you know what God's word says and you've drifted from it and said, I'm not doing that no more. Does that make you angry? Or do you say this? The Lord is right. What these guys are literally saying is, what you have done, God, is right and fair. It's true. And let me tell you, your pride will say to you, nah, it's not that bad. You, you, you. Don't listen. Don't listen. You're better than that. You're a good person. Boy, that's a big lie. Because you're not a good person, neither am I. I'm self-centered, selfish. I, got, I can go on for a month. But I can say the same thing about you. You see, anytime God says something to us, when he tells us the word of God, it's always right. It's always true. And if I'm honest, I'll receive it and say, that's right, God. But I will do even more than that. I've already humbled myself. And my humility will literally say this. But my pride will say the opposite. Pastor thinks he's so doggone holy. No, I don't. But I know who is God, and his word is true. Now, when you are going through something because of the choice you have made, and it is not good, do you say the same thing as these men did? Or do you complain and blame God or someone else? They accept they accepted what had, had happened because of their choices. What they are saying is that God, you're right and you're wrong. Listen to what first John one nine says. It says the same thing. If you confess your sin. The word confess literally means, God, you're right, I'm wrong. That would confess mean to admit you're wrong, that God is right. Verse 7. We're going to move faster. <laughs> now when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they will be his servants, that they may distinguish between my servers and from the service of the kingdom of the nations. So God says here, I'm not going to destroy them because they have humbled themselves and repented. What, what they literally do is, Shishak goes in and takes all their valuables, more or less, out of, the, out of what Solomon had given to them and all of all the house of the Lord they took all of that stuff out of there but then they became servants of Egypt and God makes this statement and listen I'm going to show them the difference between serving me and serving Egypt as a type of the world I'm going to show them the difference of serving me or them I have found it to be true that serving the world is a horrible master. That serving sin is a bondage and slavery, and it's a horrible, horrible slavery. In the last couple of weeks, I got to minister to a man who's been hooked on drugs for like 12 years now in a row. He can't get free. He'll steal, he'll rob, he'll do anything he can to fill that habit, no matter what. And I've shared Christ with him. I even prayed for him. And I asked God to deliver him. And he was okay for a couple of days or even a week, and now he's back into it again by choice. 
But the world, sin, is a horrible master. And I believe that God allows us at times to know the difference. Slavery that the world puts you in and serving God is like night and day. Serving God is a joy. I love serving God. It's not always easy. It's disappointing at times. But I'll tell you one thing, I'd rather serve God than serve the world. I'd rather serve God than serve my flesh. And so God says, you know, I'm going to let them see what it's like. And there are times that God allows us to see what it's like. Verse 9. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. They took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king's house. He took everything. He also carried away the gold shields which Solomon had made. The king Rehoboam made bronze shields in his place and committed them to the hand of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorways of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, their guard would go and bring them out, and they would take them back into the guard room. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, and, as, and so as not to destroy him completely, and things also went well in Judah. Whenever we forsake God's word, we always lose. That's just how it works. He goes on, and thus Rehoboam strengthened himself, and we're almost done. In Jerusalem, and he reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem in the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. To put his name there, his mother's name was Nehemiah and Ammonitus, and he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Let me read these last two verses, and then we're going to finish it with this thought. Verse 15 and 16, the acts of Rehoboam, first and last. Are they not written in the book of Samiah, the prophet, and Ido, the seer, concerning the genealogies? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David, and Abijah, his son, reigned in his place. Next week, we'll talk about Abijah. But let's talk about Rehoboam for one second. It says he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. That word, prepare the heart, means literally to be firm, to be secure and stable, to establish. But it has an even greater word that it comes from the meaning fixed. It literally means discipline. His life lacked discipline. He didn't daily read like he was supposed to the Word of God. He read it once in a while, prayed once in a while, talked to God, you know, when things got real tough or hard. He wasn't fixed toward God. I want to read you this word. Webster disguises, describes this word as training that develops self-control, character, or order, and efficiency, acceptance of submission to authority, control, and I got here Olympian, but I don't see where I got that at. My point is, Rehoboam did not discipline himself. We probably, during our lifetime, have seen, because of the, partly, kids not being able to go to school, because of being home, because of the COVID-19, I've seen people's life become so undisciplined, it's unbelievable. They become disciplined to watch TV. When they walk in the house, they flick the TV on, automatically the first thing that comes on. Or when they go in, I was talking to a girl, witnessing to her a couple days ago. She said her son, who is seven years old, played video, not video, it was on the iPad all weekend. 
He's disciplined, all right, on the iPad. My point is, if you are going to prepare your heart to seek the Lord, which every one of us need to, it has to be a pattern for my life, and my life has to be disciplined. I can tell you right now, you can find me exactly where I'm at, and I'll tell you every single day, you'll know where I'm at at a certain time. And the reason why I'm that there, I'm reading my Bible, I'm doing my devotionals, reading my devotionals, I'm praying every single day. You can look and see where I'm at at that time. It isn't because I'm this holy person. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with I know what I need to do to seek God. And every single Christian, I don't care who you are, I don't care what age you are, God's God doesn't, has to discipline themselves. No choice. If you're going to seek God, if, you have to, if you're going to seek God, you've got to prepare your heart to do this. That's how it works. If you just want to fleshly walk with God, you want another close relationship with God, you don't want to hear from God, you don't want God really involved in your life, then don't do this. Don't discipline yourself. Don't read your Bible. Don't pray. Don't be in God's house. Don't do any of these things. You'll be fine. But if there's ever been a time in history, it is now that we need to prepare our hearts. Amen? Because of what we're going to see and what we're going to face in this world. I asked the Lord, and you've heard me say this before, I wrote down the questions I had for God last week. And one of the questions was, God, what is it going to be like in this nation before you come? And I don't remember hearing this word. He gave me three words, chaos, confusion, and disorder. And whenever I think, I, I remember the word chaos. You know where I got that word from? I, it, it, it hits my mind or brings up something. Maxwell Smart. Remember? Chaos. Exactly. I thought, Maxwell Smart? Where did that come from? <laughs> my point is, if that's how it's going to be, then we need to be disciplined. We need to prepare our heart to seek God. Let me tell you, God wants to be your all in all. God wants to fill every need, and God wants you to lack nothing. That's God. But just like we are bone, if you sake the, forsake the word of God, if you don't prepare your heart, don't blame God. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to have questions real quick. Father, we are grateful for the word of God. And we want to thank you for the comfort and the strength that it gives us, the counsel, the wisdom it gives us, Lord God. I want to thank you, Lord God. And Father, I want to pray for any heart that has forsaken you, Lord God, or forsaken your word. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name that there would be a turning back towards you, a pulling back to you, Lord God. And I know, Lord, there has to be a humbleness first. So we humble ourselves before you, God knowing that we need you, Lord God. And Father, I want to thank you that you never give up on us, Lord God. That as you uh, allowed Shishak to come, Lord God, upon your people, Lord, that they'd be returned to you, Lord God. Thank you for that. Thank you for doing that in our lives, Lord God. Now, Lord, help us, Lord to prepare our hearts to seek you, Lord God, that you may be glorified, honored, and praised. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.